Hey, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. What's the future health? I'm talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are going to meet a seed funded startup working in the exciting world of AI and in fact, using it to help meet the needs of underdiagnosed and untreated folks with different chronic diseases in health systems. So this is exciting. And here to tell us all about it, we've got their co-founder and COO of Carenostics, Kanishka Rao. Kanishka, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Jess. Really excited to be here and chat with you. It has been a while since I have talked to a seed funded startup, and I am so excited for you guys. You just raised money, closed your round in September of this year, $5 million. You are backed by some big names in healthcare. Let's shout them out. M13, Ledger Round, Great Point Ventures, Gangels, and even Kurt Hilsinger, Humana's chairman. So you've got some big names behind you and some more that we'll talk about in a little bit who are on your advisory board. But I think the thing that most folks are going to want to know starting right off is about Kiranostics, what you guys do, and, you know, especially especially in this world where AI seems to be dominating the conversation, you know, how you're doing it using this technology. So why don't you kick us off? Tell us about the tech that you've built at Kiranostics and how you're using AI, like I said, to apply it specifically to the underdiagnosis and, un and under treatment of folks with chronic diseases. And you guys have started in chronic kidney and asthma, which are two big bucket buckets of chronic disease. So start us off there. Absolutely. Well, as you alluded to, the main thing we do at Kiranostics really so we're, we're trying to use AI to basically find opportunities to identify and act on patients before they end up in the hospital. And as you said, that's largely undiagnosed, undertreated, and health inequities in chronic disease. You know, um, the first area we started was chronic kidney disease spurred by a, you know, a personal tragedy in our family of my grandfather passing away from undiagnosed kidney disease. But that just made us just how aware of the problem and how big it is, and it made it that much more personal for us. So technology-wise, the two ways we tackle this are the AI to actually identify this cohort of people who say have undiagnosed or untreated or are really likely to get hospitalized or progress rapidly to end-stage disease if they're not uh, intervened on earlier. But then also recognizing that just finding them isn't enough. How do we help health systems actually operationalize these insights in their flows and better act on these patients? All right, I love this two-pronged attack. Let's talk about the the identification side of it because I want to get into some of the data that you guys are using here. So you guys are pulling data from the EMR, correct? Correct. All right, and and so tell me a little bit about that. Like, how does that work? And like, are you drawing it from like all different areas of of the organization? I mean, I know like a lot of time data can be siloed in, in a healthcare system. Are you guys EMR agnostic? Like, let's talk a little bit about that data, where you're pulling it from, and how that part of the model works, and then we'll get into the activation. <laughs> Yeah, fully EMR agnostic on our end. So largely we take in everything that exists in the structure, you know, structured and unstructured in the EMR at the health system. So think all the diagnoses, procedures, labs, vitals, meds, demographics, claims, notes, you name it, all of that. And, uh, and we have our common data model on our end that that all maps to that all our analytics then run on top of. To your point about siloed data, I think a lot of folks underestimate how much data and insight is available just in that existing data there. Yes, the health system may lack access to social determinants of health data or claims data from things that happen outside the health system. But, you know, we're very fortunate at Caranostics to have some of the pioneers of healthcare AI with us, you know, most notably my father, who's our co-founder and CEO. Um, Love that shout out. Love it. Absolutely. Shout out pops. But uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, you know, his expertise, he led healthcare machine learning for Siemens and KPMG before leaving to start Caranostics with me. And, uh, you know, as I said, his thesis has always been, if you actually think about what the doctor is extracting from the data, you can build features that are so much more telling than what might be naively there. For example, if you feed in, you know, three random values of blood pressure over time, you know, you, you might look at that. And if you just give that to a model, it's not going to tell that much from that. But if you actually give it the features that the clinician is seeing, the trend, the slope, the max, the range, that's the stuff that actually becomes clinically viable. And you can start to infer other things you know, from this data. The frequency of encounter or how recent they are is often telling of different social determinants when it comes to a patient. And so you know, if you can get creative with this data, as you know, we have a team that has leading expertise in healthcare data, we can actually find a lot of these insights that are sometimes missing and, and really make it low lift to just access what's already existing in there. 
I love that because I feel like a lot of times, you know, there's this pressure to get all the data from everywhere. And so this approach is really not about boiling the ocean, but really doing something that I feel like I've heard a lot of health system, you know, CIOs or chief strategy officers talk about, which is like, we don't even use the data we have in our EMR. And so this is a way to do that. That's incredible. So tell me about like the next part of it, this the other part of it where you actually get the activation. So you're using the EMR data that's already there. You're getting these insights. You're making predictions on which populations might be at risk for these certain chronic diseases. And then and then what happens? So tell me about the activation piece. And then the magic happens. Well, oh, there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll share a quote that I'm really proud of that I heard a couple of weeks ago, which was a clinician, you know, sort of to the point you were making, telling us the superpower of Karanostics is unlocking the clinical value and insights that are hidden in the EHR. If you Ooh. think about it, yeah, if you think about it from a clinician standpoint, you know, there's, I don't know, 50,000 data points in every single patient they see. And, you know, they have minutes with that patient to review all of that. It's, it's impossible. It's an, it's an overwhelming task. You know, I've seen a study that said, if you looked at everything and did every guideline based thing, a PCP would have a 27 hour workday. Um, and, and so really distilling that into the nuggets and insights that are most helpful is where we see our value add and, and, you know, ability to impact and empower the health system to act on these populations. And so, you know, when we think about operationalization, one of the key things we think about is the adoption by clinicians and physicians. Fundamentally, we think healthcare is a far cry away from automating what the clinician is doing themselves. Um, and, and we see it as, as I said, supporting these clinicians in their existing flows. And that's really the key, their existing workflows. You know, we, we can go to a health system and, and our capabilities on the AI side, finding this cohort can be integrated back <laughs> into any number of different ways on the health system side. Take the population health team, take the nurse care coordinators, take alerts at the point of care, take direct text outreach to patients. All these different workflows that already exist, we can enhance and uh, we can enhance basically with the AI insights and intelligence we're able to generate from the data. And it's awesome. been very cool now moving further down that path of, you know, ensuring that the story of my grandfather doesn't oh, repeat no. itself by actually in, taking more ownership and, and taking more action across the rest of that chain. I love that. And I think, you know, I love the two smart things you said in there. It's like not using AI to replace the clinician and then also, you know, integrating into their workflow, because I think that's where a lot of times there's there's trouble if there's one extra added step that needs to be done. I mean, as good as the data might be or the prediction might be, if it's not at that point where the clinician needs it already in the system that they're working in, there's a, a little bit of, of friction in terms of adoption. So let's another piece of friction and adoption I want to ask you about is, you know, using AI at the clinical level, because I feel like, you know, especially now where there is just so much focus on AI startups and he, he and I were chatting earlier and you mentioned you guys were um, awarded at health this year, you know, one of the rising as the rising star AI company. And there were like, what was it? 400 different entrants in that category. So, I mean, this is a big category of startup, you know, focusing on AI. And one of the things I hear a lot is reluctance on the, the part of, you know, provider orgs, especially to integrate AI at in care delivery, because it's a little bit risky. I mean, it's not as easy as saying like, okay, let's integrate the AI, you know, on our claims, you know, business, because, you know, there's no, there's no real risk to that. You know, there's no lives in danger. Um, but on the clinical side, there's a little bit of apprehension you know what do you say to that how do you how do you make provider orgs feel comfortable and in the fact that AI is kind of de-risked in your model um, so that they can feel feel like they're okay adopting it I think it's uh it's a very top of mind point you know I heard someone talk about it as AI is the first use case everyone's going to is these swivel chair jobs you know, the, the, not the clinician, but the procurement, the, the scheduling, the, um, you know, the, the coding all these reminders. Yeah, exactly. All those things that already, you know, are clear cost savings opportunity, automation opportunity, but as you said, no risk of, Oh, what are we going to do with the patient? But when we really distilled, what is that risk? You know, it comes back to that point of where it's not going to replace the clinician. And so if you can give decision support that is 
intelligible to the physician one is is critical to it to gain adoption and that's why all our models are built to be intelligible with intelligible ai rather than some black box that you don't know what it's pulling in to come up with its predictions um but but the other thing that's really important is the biases that exist in this you know you, you were talking about how there's been this push to get as much data as you can in to build the best model on the biggest data. The problem with healthcare is data is so localized and the way people practice medicine is so specific to where they are, you know, how they practice, what data they collect, how frequently they collect, when and why they collect, how they collect, um, that, that impacts things. And when you have a model that's learned at scale, like say, you know, Epic tried this with their sepsis model. They tried to build a model on all their data. And as soon as they took it to another health system, it started to work worse, worse of all, it worked worse on the Hispanic population and historically disadvantaged population when it comes to healthcare in this country. And, uh, and that's a, been a big area of focus of us at Carenostics. Just last week, we put out an article with, uh, with Care Journey, you know, looking into the health inequities that exist in uh, chronic kidney disease nationwide and, and found some staggering numbers about just how wide those disparities are and why it's so important to us to build models with bias adjusted machine learning that actually counteracts the underlying data that it, the biases that exist in the data in healthcare. You know, that's the problem. If you just apply machine learning to the data already, it learns the unfortunate patterns that exist in the data today. Um, yeah. And, and this is paramount and important, especially as we go across therapeutic areas, now moving from chronic kidney disease into asthma, two, two diseases that have massive health disparities, um, you know, when it comes to these underprivileged and underserved populations. I love this. I love the, the health disparities um, angle on this. And I have to go back to what you said about leaning into the localization of like, how care is delivered and then how the data kind of reflects that. So I think that's really interesting. Say a little bit about how you guys are tackling this health disparities piece. Like that's interesting. And I, I, I feel like it's connected to what you just said about the, the localization of healthcare. But, you know, what are you looking for specifically to ensure that your models don't perpetuate that bias that you 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 and Care Journey identified? <laughs> yeah, I I won't get overly technical, but let me see if I can give it at a high we'll level. We'll go read the paper if we need a follow-up, <laughs> but give me the gist. <laughs> so, uh, well, for one, we're working with one of the world experts in bias-adjusted machine learning, Professor Ryan Ghani out of Carnegie Mellon, who's uh, who's been a pioneer of this in the fields of criminal justice and public health um, when applying, you know, uh, un uncovering biases and counteracting them in the data. Essentially, there's a number of tactics you can do, but if you just think about if you do nothing, that machine learning is trying to optimize a model on the majority. You know, what is the highest, what is the average thing? But what often happens if you just optimize on the majority, you're going to end up doing this well on, say, uh, privileged populations who come in regularly and this well on populations who don't. What If you're instead optimizing for, say, equality, where rather than them continuing to exacerbate, they're now going parallel, or you could optimize even for equity where I'm fine performing a little worse on this population with the mandate of getting to a more equitable future. Those are just different, I guess, yeah, values you can train your model to optimize on um, that we're experimenting with. And always at the end of it, measuring the performance of the model on equity, I think is an under, uh, underutilized approach and, and something that should become much more commonplace when we audit the models that we built. That's so cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the outcomes you guys have have generated so far. And so I know you guys are deployed at different health systems, the biggest of which I think is Hackensack Meridian. So tell me a little bit about what you've seen, you know, deploying your models in health systems. I mean, as far as, and like we had said before, you guys started out with chronic kidney disease because of your personal connection to that and then moved into asthma. But like, so tell us what you guys have been able to do there. Like, how are you able to, how much early um, under diagnosis are you you able to identify how much under treatment like give us some sense of the numbers here yeah um well you know some of the stats in these conditions are astounding you know chronic kidney disease 80 percent of people are undiagnosed and so um what we're able to find is is in recent studies we're finding more than three times that population of the current diagnosed population um, by using our, our AI to identify patients who we believe if you tested them today, you would see they have it. And now moving further down that path to not just who has it undiagnosed today, but 
okay, who of the patients diagnosed are, are likely to progress rapidly or who of the patients are likely to hospitalize? And then on the flip side with, with severe and uncontrolled asthma, you know, there's 6% of patients who drive 50% of hospitalizations. Essentially, can we help prioritize which are the patients who need more active preventative care because they're likely to end up in the ER or the hospital if they're not intervened on? And that's a population where you know, we're finding in some cases up to an order of magnitude more patients than, than currently you know, in the funnel for, uh, for preventative intervention. And that's just because of the problem of how challenging uh, we've made healthcare and how much of a burden we've put on our clinicians. And this is where you know, if we can take all that data that exists and help elucidate or, or surface the most relevant data points to them that they know what to do with, if, they're, if it's given to them in a consumable format, that's, that's the value here. We find those populations and we give them the relevant data so that they can deliver the care that they know best how to deliver. I love that. And one of the stats that I really liked, because, you know, as you think about this, it's like, okay, you're identifying these populations, you're getting them in, maybe doing some early testing, helping them out. Well, is this just creating like, you know, medical waste? Is this just, is this just being alarmist in some degree? But no, the stat that I saw that I liked is that you guys have five times fewer false positives on your data than if you were just randomly kind of bringing people and say a little bit about that. How are you guys making sure that it's, that you're not just like bringing in anybody and that you guys are like really identifying those who, um, who are in need of care and, and having such great results like that in terms of the false yeah. positives. Well, this is the critical problem in healthcare. If you think about it, it is a resource constrained problem. It is not helpful to say, hey, there's a million patients who have, you know, for chronic kidney disease are diabetic or hypertensive or obese or elderly. And I'm going to give you a list of a million patients. That doesn't help anyone because no one can intervene on a million patients. But if I can say, here are the 10,000 or 50,000 of those patients that you really need to prioritize getting in and doing an intervention on because they're likely to have a bad outcome if you don't, that's the value of AI in this whole journey. And that's what we're optimizing for. And, and really, if you think about you know machine learning and statistics, I can get to a smaller and smaller percentage of the population in a higher sort of predictive value on that population, but lower sort of predictive value on the whole. Um, so we can we can basically flex how, how specific we need to be based off the health system's resource constraints. If you can only test a thousand patients versus you can test 10,000 patients, we can perform better on the thousand patients, but we can get way more patients with the 10,000. And that's sort of what the risk stratification that we fundamentally bring uh, allows the system. That. To, to prioritize resources. Yeah. I love it. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the business because I'm sure people at this point are like, okay, the tech sounds great. The care delivery piece of this sounds awesome. But like, what, how do you guys make money? How do you guys generate revenue? What can you tell us about that, about the business side of this? Like, how do you guys, how do you guys get paid? Or is it, are you guys taking on risk? Like, tell me a little bit about how you guys get paid. Yeah. I think, you know, AI applications in healthcare in general, I think, yeah, before this, I led um, the healthcare startups practice at McKinsey in the U.S., um, helping innovative companies go to market. What you see is like innovation gets a little stale in healthcare when people stop being creative about the business models. And just the reality yeah. is, you know, while we're in this nascent stage of value-based care, the provider is the least incentivized financially of anyone in the health system, health ecosystem, to intervene on these patients. And uh, our model has actually been, we offer this for free to the health systems. We want to empower them. We want to enable those clinicians. Um, and then we're gonna go tap into the other folks who are aligned with this. This early intervention on patients is the one of the very few win, 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 wins in healthcare. The patient benefits the most, the health system delivers better care, but then you have the payer reducing long-term costs and you have the pharma company where pharmacological intervention might be the intervention for that patient to prevent the progression. And so when you get all these players aligned, we see it as logical to go after the payers and pharma companies awesome. who are you know, benefiting more financially to support this rollout and actually making this happen at scale. 
That is awesome. I love the model innovation. We're going to have the payers and the pharma companies kind of support this so that the provider can have it for free. I love it. That's different. Much better than per member per month, right? <laughs> There's great things in those it. models. Seats, yeah. on the, seats on the platform. So I love the model <laughs> innovation there. I love it. All right. Let's end with this. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, what's ahead for you guys? I mean, one of the things, you know, I teased at the beginning, you know, on your about your fundraise, you guys just closed that $5 million seed round. You've added some folks to your your advisory board and your advisory board let's just stop for a second here i mean you've just added <laughs> Fred Helsinger from the chairman of humana which is exciting then you know you've got dr john glazer who's the former ceo of siemens health services anish chopra the former chief technology officer of the united states i'm like you've got like a who's who there and i mean i'm interested to you know as you guys are evolving and looking ahead into next year you know what is having like this this group of kind of health leaders do to you know enhance the credibility of what you're going to offer and where are you going to take that next <laughs> well it's we're very fortunate to have leaders like them and pioneers and visionaries in the space with us the the greatest thing about those folks is they're not as granular in what's going on but they know exactly where the puck is going before anyone else in healthcare uh, if the payer market moving the government is moving the health systems are moving they they just have that vision and allow us to build the solution not you know for yesterday but the solution for five years from now and that's fundamentally it you know just if you get back to what we said everyone is focused on these swivel chair jobs, these automations, these easy applications of AI to healthcare. I won't say easy, but, but these initial applications of AI to healthcare. And we all know the big value comes when it can actually help inform our clinical decisions. We're simply just not willing to wait for the industry to move there. And we're trying to pioneer and push that envelope on and accelerate the adoption of AI in the clinical space. Um, and, and that's our vision. So over the next couple of months, you know, with this fundraise now, we've been very fortunate to scale up the clinical side of our team, you know, hiring on two nurses um, and, and PhDs in nursing and CMOs to, to help us with the, the activation of the health systems and the care workflows for the clinicians. Um, but also, you know, our platform is built to expand to new therapeutic areas and demonstrating time and time again that when we build this model and we've got this platform, it actually works when we take it from system to system and from therapeutic area to therapeutic area. So our near term priority is exactly that scaling up the number of health systems and diseases where we're deploying our technology to, yeah, help the story, stop the story of my grandfather from repeating itself. I love that. I love the I love the purpose behind the mission. I love the fact that you're partnered up with your dad to do this. And then the, the, all of these other like incredible healthcare leaders. And I like the the sensible use of AI and integrating it in the clinical care delivery process is just incredible. So congratulations on what you guys have built here, Kanishka. It's awesome to speak with you and learn more about it. Thank you again for stopping by. Thanks so much, Jess. Really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, everybody. That was Kanishka Rao. He is the co-founder and COO of Caronastics. You can go look them up, find out more about them before they come to a hospital near you. And to find more interviews with the people who are changing the way that we do healthcare, you can head on over to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash WTF Health. I'm Jessica DeMassa. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.